Hello everyone, welcome to the Desolation Sounds podcast. My name is Stephen Hook and this is a podcast celebrating everything to do with the world of alternative music. Be that rock, punk, metal or even extreme metal since it is a week before Christmas. Or less than a week before Christmas depending on when you listen to this. Coming up this week, news from Def Leppard, Green Day, Greta Van Fleet and Linkin Park as well as where new music is coming from this week. There's not a lot, as it is almost Christmas. Everyone's having their holidays at the moment. As well as album reviews from Last Farewell, Author and Punisher, Octaves, and as promised last week, Black Peaks. And so, and also the Screen Jared Bag. <clears throat> First news then. Def Leppard is to be inducted into the 2019 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, the Sheffield Baron formed in 1977 will lead the 2019 induction class. They will also be joined by Stevie Nicks, The Zombies, The Cure, Janet Jackson, Radiohead and Roxy Music. I've never heard of Roxy Music, but I'm going to assume they're pretty good based on the induction. Um, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame has been a weird one from what I've read. Because also, exclude, well, one of the acts excluded from going in this year. I think it was LL Cool J, who is decidedly not rock and or roll. I know, isn't it 25 years after your first, after your debut album is when you can go in? But I read a thing, I read an article recently. Uh, Zach Della Rocca of Rage Against the Machine has outright said he wants nothing to do with Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He doesn't feel like. I think he basically went, they can fuck off. Is the long and short of it he's not a big fan so i think def leppard getting the recognition they i think quite easily deserve is quite nice but it depends where your stance is on this whether or not it's a good thing or not it's not something that should matter i feel like def leppard have made a name of themselves without the help of this anyways and the people who need to know who they are know who they are um Interesting one, this. Linkin Park, yeah, Linkin Park bassist, I can never talk, I wish I could. Uh, Linkin Park bassist Dave Phoenix Farrell, 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 some sort of Farrell. Um, he believes that the band will make music together one day. Uh, he had an interview with Billboard and he says, it's a big question, I think the easiest way to answer is... Uh, oh yeah. I think the easiest way to answer it is probably just to say, I don't know. And then I can expand on that. I can expound upon that. Why? Why? What a weird word. Um, he continues. The five of us, we still love getting together to hang out. We hang out quite a bit. I think we will do music again. We all want to. We all in, We all still enjoy being together and being around each other. I'm a big fan of this. I like the idea of all the guys working together for a new project. I'm not keen on the idea of it being called Linkin Park, though. I will be honest. Um, I've discussed it with a few friends of mine how odd it is to continue a band because of like something happened to one person be that someone passing away in the case of Linkin Park on the complete opposite end I'm not comparing this at all what happened with Brand New and Lost Profits like the guys from Lost Profits they continue to make music together but they do it on a new project and so it's hard like with um, Avenged Sevenfold as well they can they said the rev was a huge part of their sound and like you go back on the early stuff compared to the newer stuff you can absolutely see why they say that and but they continued under the Avenged Sevenfold moniker and it's difficult when you have such an iconic voice like Chester I think too much of Linkin Park's identity is around what Chester Bennington can do or could do I should say sad to say as well um but i'm all for i know oh fuck what's his name mike shinoda has already started solo projects with like this chill rap rock project he's gone on for and i'm all about that Pers like i like i said personally i would love it if they all came back together and did some kind of project together maybe with shinoda as lead singer or they get someone else to do a role like they did back in the day but on a personal note again it's all down to the guys I prefer it if they did it under a different name. But it's all down to them. At the end of the day, as bad as it sounds, they need to do something that's profitable to them so they can. They've all got families. 
I think they're all supporting um, Chester's family as well that he's left behind. And so yeah, I'll walk down for this and I'll be quite intrigued to find out how like you look at Holy Hell, how they've sort of like paid homage to Tom and what they're doing with it or what they did with it. I'd like to see it sounds shit, but I'd like to see how they've Chester's um, affected them and how they can sort of like give back to Chester. Um Greta Van Fleet, which is a really annoying name to say, um, are already planning a follow-up to their 2018 debut anthem of the Peaceful Army, with a view for a 2019 release. Um, again, during a chat with Billboard bassist Sam Kishka, I think I've pronounced that right, K-I-S-Z-K-A, we'll go with Kishka. Um, he revealed the plans, a lot of writing, getting some stuff recorded, and starting working on the next thing. And then their drummer, David Wagner, Wagner, Wagner. Continued with, oh yeah, absolutely, we'll quit if we don't. And then the front man, Josh Kishka, fuck that guy, jumped in and said, we'll all quit. We're parting ways if we don't release new music. That's very much a... Oh, making it sound like a lot bigger thing because, hey, if we don't release anything, just assume we're broken up. I think to get like the younger or like more inexperienced fan base, like, oh, hey, we could leave just to get that extra bit of excitement in the band. Um, I haven't listened to the debut. I've been told it's quite boring. It's a lot of Zeppelin worship, which if you're into that sort of thing, go ahead. Personally, it's not for me, but there you go. T Greta Van Fleet album two coming next year, apparently. And last but not least, Green Day frontman Billy Joe Armstrong has confirmed that he's writing new music for the band. Uh, it got uh, weirdly announced during a recent Instagram live video. Um, they were streaming something and one of the comments was from his personal Instagram saying, I'm already writing new music, which is the most 2018 way of announcing new music I think you could possibly ever imagine, apart from writing in your arms and dabbing. It will come as a follow-up to 2016's Revolution Radio, which I personally really enjoyed. I know Newer Green Day gets a lot of shit, but I really like Revolution Radio. It was a lot better than Uno Dos Tres. Also, 21st Century Breakdown is really good as well. There, I said it. Um, and it also comes after he's done The Long Shot, which is a solo, well not quite solo, but a, a side project I should say, um, a power pop punk outfit he, he fronted, and I fucking love it. The Long Shot album, it's called Kill, no, it's either self side or called Kill Your Friends, because I know there was like 27,000 EPs that were like released in amongst it, but like that, it's not, it's very, how can I describe it? The older school, not even the old school fan, it is the more modern take of Green Day, where it's very clean, very mainstream, almost, I wouldn't say poppy, but a lot of people have said it's like that. It's that, but with the old school Green Day aesthetic. Aesthetic. And yeah, it's very, not quite gritty, but it's quite, it's not, it's not all time low, is basically what I'm saying. It's not that level of pop rock, but it is superbly amazing and personally I wouldn't mind if he carried on doing a long shot because it's getting harder and harder to defend Green Day but outside Revolution Radio those Una Dos Trace albums were really ungood and this week there's only been new music because like I said it's nearly Christmas everyone wants to fuck off for the week um, there's new music from Overkill they've got the new song Last Man Standing for their album The Wings of War out 22nd of February next year and Kanye have released their second single from Kill the Sun EP out the 18th of January. And this song is called Acid Rain. I really do. I, it's alright. It, I like Kane Hill. One, their latest album. Excuse me. Uh, the latest album is possibly one of my favourite of the year. And I like that aggressive but still together new metal metalcore sound. Like Vane, for example... I think they're quite good comparisons, Kane Hill, um, Kane Hill and Vane. Vane are very much like the converge of this new metal, uh, metalcore sound, which is fine. I do like Arizona, and then Kane Hill is more not sub. It's more together. You've got it's a bit more dumbed down. So you've got verse, chorus, verse, chorus. But I think they do it really, really well. And I really like the first album as well. So this new 
bluesy acoustic alt rock sound they're going for. It might just be a one-off. I prefer if it wasn't. It's good, but it's not quite as good as the old stuff. But, you know, it's all personal preference at the end of the day. And that's what we live for here. Uh, okay, so there's no new albums announced because couldn't. No live reviews because I'm poor. So we'll go straight into album reviews. And first one is going to be a quick one because it's only a five song EP. It is the self-titled EP from... A Spanish outfit called Last Farewell. Um, they're kind of post-rocky, post-hardcore sort of thing. Remind me a lot of Touche Amore on their more grittier ends. And there's a lot of really good ideas in the EP. The one thing I've realised that I really, really enjoy is a really clean instrumentals with really lo-fi vocals. Of all places, I found this in the song Call Up By Name by The Weeknd. Really clean, really bassy R&B beat, and then I think the second chorus he does so call out my name, but really, it's the '90s, and you're recording it through a potato, through a tuba. That really, that gritty. I really, really like that. I don't know why, but it's considering I've, by my own confession, I'm a huge production snob nowadays. I really, really like that. And whether they've done it on purpose or just because they haven't got that much money, I know which one I think it is, um, the vocals in this sound very lo almost lo-fi against what's quite clean-cut instrumentals. And the music ideas themselves, they're nothing, they're interesting, but they're nothing new. I think the production does let down quite a lot. Um, the rhythm section is very much the do -dun, do -dun, do -dun, do -dun, do -dun, do the same thing people have been doing for quite a few years now. But, like I said, the vocals have really helped that out. The lead guitar has a lot of melody and doesn't just follow along the lines of like da 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 They actually overlap it with some, not quite whittly shit, so it's progressive, but it keeps things, it keeps your mind occupied while you listen to the rest of it. It very much reminds me of mid-2000s metalcore with that post-rock backing, so it's very, it's quite ethereal, quite atmospheric. And like I said, it's quite chugging rhythm section with very whittly hooks. And for me, the best songs on the EP are the start and finish. So the uh, opening song is a song called I... Oh, fuck, it's Japanese. Akai Ito? A-K-A-I, splice, I-T-O. In Wikipedia, it says that there's two Japanese TV shows and they're called Red Thread. Or the English translation is, we'll go with that. Why not? Um, and it's a super strong start. It's almost quite nostalgic for the OG post-hardcore. Because where it is quite, inter quite interesting in the background, the forefront of it is very abrasive and in-your-face. I think that's down to the low fineness of the vocal performance. And it's weird. So the three songs that come after it, which I can't remember off the top of my head the names of them. But each of them have got one thing in spades. It's got very chugging rhythm, very woodly hooks, and very powerful vocal performance. Each of those three songs excels in one of those three things. Whereas uh, this one, oh, I'm trying to pronounce it again. This one has all three of those things sort of combined together for like a really good final product. And I feel like if more of the songs were like this, more people would be interested, which is easy to say because they are like a, this is their debut release from Spain, no offence Spain, don't know many alternative artists from that place of the world who have made, who, who are well known names, the only one I can think of is Heroes de Silencia, and anyone who's ever played Guitar Hero 3, 3, will remember the song, well might remember the song Avalancha, really great song, but you know what I mean. And the final song on the album, it, or final song, EP I should say, is a song called House on Fire, which is pretty much the EP's ballad. Uh, it, and it's in two parts, it's like seven minutes long. And the first half of it is very slow, very emotional, and it builds up for what ends up being the second half, which is back into a really emotional, atmospheric hardcore. And I really like this last song. I don't, I can't decide which one of that more between first song and house on fire because there's 
the bit that separates House on Fire from the slow ballad at the start to this really aggressive hardcore coda is the singer uh, whose name I've forgotten already. He um, he's clean singing the first half, and then he's sort of like almost almost talks like a poet. But really, like he's got so much emotion in his voice, almost like he's on the brink of tears, obviously because of the style of music this is, and the way like his English doesn't sound like his first language, obviously it might be because it's Spanish. It's got that like little extra edge to it, and then so yeah, it's the clean, quite clean singing, and then this like poetic stanza, I guess. I, it's been a while since I've done GCSE music. Not quite sure stanza is the right word, but. That little um, vocal bit, and then it's very, it's very, very, very quickly extends to like the full scream, and then the whole, the rest of the song kicks in, and then yeah, it's this big uproar of emotional hardcore. I really enjoyed this. I found it on Bandcamp somewhere, and it was free. I really, really um, wait, no, I don't think it was free. I think it was like three quid. And check it out if you want. It's if you're a fan, like I said, if you're a fan of Touche Amore, more first and second album era, uh, being as an ocean, and Canvas. If you know any of them, if you really like them, I suggest Last Farewell to you. And their, like I said, their EP is self-titled Last Farewell with the Last Farewell EP. Uh, it's very warm in this room. Next up is real. Oh God, this album was so hard to find words for. Author and Punisher with their sixth studio album, Beastland. Um, Author and Punisher were, is a one-man industrial doom metal project from San Diego, California. I first became aware of him and his project when he guested on the latest Cattle Decapitation album, and that song sounds fucking terrifying. It was great. He makes music using homemade custom made machinery called drone machines and they manipulate peach peach pitch and gain to loops and samples for this very noise ambient influenced industrial doom uh it's very dark it's very noisy it's very terrifying so it the way i could describe it is it's like the soundtrack to the zombie to the robotic apocalypse like you play fallout and you when you Get away from the wasteland for more like the mutations and you're into more like corporate areas where it's like loads of drones. This is what should be playing because it's fucking haunting as shit. Kurt Ballou does a production job so you can understand why it's fucking terrifying. He, of course, of Converge fame. This is a difficult listen. I don't know if that's because for me it's industrial and doom. Not two things I particularly pay much attention to, but... For me it took a few listens. It is that noise and ambient thing like I said. For it doesn't really cater to a traditional song set. The closest thing to that, where the noise influences are toned back a bit, um, so it is closer to more quote unquote traditional song, is the song Apparition. Really gets his vocal performance out there, and he's not singing and it's not screaming, it's that like middle gap where it's like the gravelly, eh, that was awful, I'll never do that again, probably. Um, but yeah, Apparition. One of my male favourite songs on there because it is you've got you can hear him and I always like it to as much as I just said about lo fi, I like to hear the actual vocalist actually sing. I think the reason why I gravitate more towards this is because it is Doom Metal, and like I said, I'm not au fait with Doom. It goes closer to the sludge metal side of things. Like down and crowbar, as opposed to more stoner side of things where it's all eclectic and just I'm not that big fan of Stoner. Really like Sludge though. So yeah, go yeah, like I said. So with it being more Sludge, to me, I find it's more visceral and aggressive and a bit crunchier as opposed to Stoner. I think well, Nihil. There's a song called Nihil Strength, and a lot of the song is just him repeatedly screaming the word Nihil Strength, and it sounds like a battle cry in a war against old CRT monitors. It's fucking haunting as shit. Um. And despite the fact it is industrial and it's a very electronic album, it's probably one of the most extreme albums I've heard this year. 
that I could actually make sense of and take in. Um, and for me, it was hard to find a comparison. But if I found if you really if you like Godflesh, you'll really really enjoy this album. I saw a lot of crossover there. And if you are into that more niche band of that weird electro stuff, it's a band called or a one man project called Igor. That's I G O R R R. If you're a fan of Godflesh, you're a fan of this. If you're a fan of this, you might be a fan of Igor. If you're a fan of both those things, you might be a fan of Author and Punisher. That was it. Yeah, that made sense. Um, so yeah, Author and Punisher, Beastland, Industrial Doom Metal. Go on, check it out. Um, I feel like I'm blasting through these really quickly. Uh, third album for this week. It is, well, I suppose because there's no fucking news because everyone's on holiday. And I should be as well, but no holiday this season. Uh, third album for this week is Exact Change by the band called Octaves. Um, they are a five piece from Baltimore, Maryland, up in the United States of Yankistan. They, online, I saw them described as post rock and post hardcore and this sort of shenanigans. They are so very experimental. Uh, yeah. This is album number three for them, and it doesn't really have singing. It's somewhere between spoken word and singing. And the best way I can describe it is like talking in tune and with timing, which that's kind of how you would describe singing. But it's just it's just really not. I can't. It's so hard to describe what it is that they do. Excuse me. And it musically, it's, it is all there. Imagine if Mastodon... And they drank milk instead of drinking every liquid stint substance except milk known to man. It's full of creativity. It's full of ideas. It's just a lot cleaner and a little bit pulled back. Musically, I really enjoy this album. I think if there's a version of this album that doesn't have the vocals, I think that would make for a lot better album, maybe? Um, it's just... It combines so much. There's a lot of there's a lot of rock and roll in this. There's waltz in this. There, it's very progressive, and I do agree with, to some extent with the post hardcore label. There's a little bit of that in there, and there's a swells of indie in there as well. It's a very DIY kind of sound, which, like, I'm all for. I just, I just, it's probably personal, but I cannot get on board with that vocal delivery. Like musically, Shanty is a really Shanty. It's a really upbeat, rockabilly-inspired song, and it's really, really good. I, like listening back to it, just ignoring his vocal performance, it's actually really, really good. Yeah, um, like I said, lots of rockabilly. So it's got lots of beat, um, it's toe tap sort of music, and then you've got another song called "Like Larks," which is very slow, very sleazy, bluesy. And yeah, take out the vocal performance again, makes for a great song. The only song that I can really think of where I can take on. The music performance, as well as his vocal style, is in the title track, Exact Change. And I feel like he's got... The, the chorus of it is him holding like holding the vocal note. And it becomes... It, the way he delivers the uh, chorus, it's very dramatic. And I feel like if there's a whole album of that, I'd be a lot more on board with it. Even if the in Exact Change, the verses are still the like talking in time sort of thing. If the, ho if the rest of the album was more the talking of time with the big swell actual singing vocal, um, choruses, I think I'd be a lot higher on this album. But because of how he delivers the vocal lines, I just, for me, I can't get on board with it. It is very odd. It's so experimental. It, you can't pin this down to one cup type of genre. I found comparisons to if you've found if you've listened to Diablo Swing Orchestra, which I know they go viral every now and again, and so they've probably built up an audience through that. If you're a fan of Diablo Swing Orchestra, uh, Thumper Monkey, which is a great thing to say out loud, um, Wax Fang for any niche American Dad fans out there, I reckon you might be on board with this because, like I said, it's as weird as it is, it's hugely experimental, it's hugely progressive. Look out for if you're a fan of them, look out for this. It's Octaves with Exact change and for some reason like a lot of prog music i've looked at a lot of prog music recently and that brings us to the main event for this week and it is i promised it last week I was gonna rush it i want to give it 
the time it needed, even though I am blasting through this episode like a motherfucker. It is All That Divide by English prog group, metal group Black Peaks. It is their sophomore album, and it's their second studio album, and it's a follow-up to the hugely successful and hugely popular debut, Statues. Now, I missed Statues. I've got it. I haven't listened to it yet. I, it completely passed me by because for ages I kept getting mixed up with Black Keys and had no idea why everyone was going mental over them. This is because I am a grade A fucking moron and B, every new, well, every band at some point has had Black in their name. Like, just trying to find these to listen to them again to write a review. You type, you go, like, search for Black in iTunes. I've just got a swell of black something bands and it's fucking annoying black label society black sabbath uh black audio even though it's spelled differently the whole idea of it is just so fucking infuriating and another reason why i could never really me with this album well like this yeah with band sorry is because they got hit with the prog metal label and prog metal for me is so difficult because i have such a short attention span which people might be picking up on with how I pre present this, but there we go. I have such a short attention span, and I hate having to listen for a seven minute song, which has got somehow a five minute long keyboard solo with a 20 minute long guitar solo, and then the drummer just needs to make sure everyone remembers he's there, and the basses can go off for a fag. And like Dream Theater for me is possibly one of the worst things that's ever happened, just because they are all such fantastic. Fantastic, fantastic musicians, but my short attention span, my suspected my parents, autism, I love that short, pacey, punk rock feel of music, where it's just like, you're in, you've got your two minutes, you're out, everyone's blown away, everyone's having a great time. So I flick this on, and oh my fucking god, your script from start to finish. The fact they opened up. the They had the balls. To open up with Can't Sleep. Fucking riffs. Faux days. It is just insane. There's no fiddly guitar solo. Um, sorry. There's no fiddly keyboard solo. There's no guitar solo. That feels like it's over saying it's welcome. Everything is precise. Everything is in moderation. To how much it needs to be. And. You're j I'm just, you put the so first song on and you kind of feel that you have to listen to the entire thing just to take it all in. Electric Fires is everything, everything I've ever needed from a song. It's got a lo-fi beginning, which I was saying before, with Last Farewell and The Weeknd. Lo-fi vocal um, performance that keeps coming in and out, but mostly there in the beginning. It's got a big melodic fr break, which ends up building up to a big big soundscape big big chorus and then just oh my god the fucking chorus of the song itself i love that clean build up and then the huge huge like scream crescendo and it's just ah oh, electric fire might be one of my favorite songs of the year i'm not going to try and do like a top 20 songs uh, list. I went through my list the other day. I've listened to nearly 130 albums this year. I'm not going to do that. Um, at its most melodic, this album can easily go toe to toe with your Biffy Clyros or your Foo Fires. And when it's at its angriest, it's rubbing shoulders with Gijira and the Shan. It is. It's every bit that's that. It's got bits that sound like it's contemporaries on both levels. Like there's parts on it with his vocal performance. Why I thought I was listening to listening to Leprous, which is a Norwegian prog rock band, and they do the backing. They're the backing band for Ashan every time he performs live. You've got swells in there that sound like um, Devon Townsend as well, with just like the wall of sound hitting you. And as much as they sound like people on the like similar vein, they're inspired. You can sound, you can hear where they're inspired by the likes of again Devon Townsend, Mastodon. Ishan. There's even bits in there that sound like this OG Muse back when they were good. And just the 
the way Muse did it back in the day, where they had like a song like "Plug and Baby," is such a weird song to hear, but it made such a mainstream pull for the band. And there's bits on there where you could easily hear, like take bits of it and put it on the radio now and have it just on. I don't know what music channels are live anymore. Is the box still going? We'll say the box. Black Peaks could be on the box with some of the bits in this album. Yeah, God, am I showing my age? I don't think so. And this, ah, oh, I cannot get over how much I enjoy this album. And it, this albums like this make me so frustrated why you hear the argument that Roth is dead. Like Gene Simmons has been saying it for years. Ollie Sykes said it last week, or Ollie Sykes said it was boring last week. If you look outside your own personal little bubble, you will see that rock music in rock music in the UK is doing fucking fine. Like take a band like every level as well. So you've got Black Peaks, which is easily break into a mainstream audience and be on like your if I say quote unquote average radio stations and all your normal quote again quote unquote normal TV channels easily have on this on there like i said it can be along with your biffy clyros and your foo fighters but you've got things out bands like rollo tomasi palm reader conjurer milk tea marmoset judas priest have been going for nigh on 40 fucking years and their album this year puts most metal bands to fucking shame out of nowhere they've made one of the best albums since well some people say the best album since british steel Cannot say st st at the moment. British steel. And you'll just. That's just the UK. You look at. Outside of that, you've got. Like, Zealand Arda have made, has made one of the most interesting and. Just fucking weird, but in a good way, albums. That's been seen in ages, combining two genres of metal. Two genres of music that should not be put together. And just going, ah, fuck it, why not? But again, outside of the UK, you've got Turnstile, you've got, like I said before, Kane Hill, The Perfect Circle, like Power Wolf, for some reason, as people were saying, like one of the biggest albums of the year. Behemoth, like bringing black metal into the mainstream, for fuck's sake. I mean, come on, you cannot say that rock music is struggling at all when you've got Bands like all the ones I've just said, and you've got an album like All That Divides, satisfying the Grieve Nation that likes it when people are screaming at them, but also could break into the mainstream and satisfy Cindy from around the corner. If you're a fan of, like, excluding that round, like I said, if you've got like the slightest inkling into interesting music not just like alt rock or prog or anything like that. if you just like interesting good music you owe it to yourself to find this album because i think there's something in here for every kind of musical fan um again like i keep bringing back to um, biffy clyro i'm so out of touch with what's on your normal music channels at the moment but if you like the biffy clyro you like the muses uh, Periphery, Ishan, like I said, a little bit of Mastodon on there. You will really, really enjoy this album. Even if you don't, if you hate all those bands, I still think you'll fucking love this album because it's so good. And yeah, it's just. If you find someone who says Rock is Dead, you can beat them to death with this album. Or any of those albums, uh, any of the albums that from those bands I said before. So you roll the Mask, Palm Reader, Condra, Mom Sets, Milk Tea, etc. And. Yeah, I hope it does just as I hope it was worth the week of saying, ah, it's gonna it's next week, guys, you know it's gonna come. I hope it's worth all that. I know I just keep rambling incoherently, but it's what I do. This, this room's very, very warm. Next week will be obviously next week will be Boxing Day. And the week after that will be New Year's Day. Sure. And as you can imagine, we're all gonna be rather busy. So instead of having a news and uh, album reviews because no one's going to be fucking doing anything over the next two weeks I'll be recording and releasing my top 20 albums of the year which like I said last week it's going to be weird considering this. there will be episodes 4 and 5 and I'm saying hey here's all the music from this year because I've only done what 
11 album? We'll go with 11. But hopefully with the next two, couple of weeks and me saying this album's number 15, 20, 8, how numbers work, it will give an idea about what's to come from the show and if it's worth you guys sticking around to find out what sort of music I'll be listening to. Uh, so, until next time, I've been Stephen Hook, this has been Desolation Podcast, and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.